Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight I'm continuing the study of the book of Acts. Uh, we've made a lot of progress already. Uh, tonight we're going to begin with chapter 16, verse 1, and see how far I can get. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies of the book of Acts, I urge you to go to my YouTube channel and watch the entire series from the beginning. Those uh, videos are uploaded and available for you now. Uh, but for now, let's start with chapter 16, verse 1. And I'm a KJV firster, so I'll read it first in the KJV. I may also look at it in the Amplified translation. Uh, sometimes I find that to be helpful. So let's begin with chapter 16, verse 1 in the KJV. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, Timotheus, Tim, Tim, Timotheus, I don't know. It's like Timothy with, with Theus on the back of it. Um, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, so his mother was Jewish, and, and believed, but his father was Greek. So the the mother is a Jewish woman who is a believer, a believer meaning that she believed in Jesus uh, and is a, a Christian. And Timothy or Timotheus uh, is um, her son. He's also a believer, but his father, Timothy's father, was Greek. So, in a way, I, I guess you'd have to refer to Timotheus as uh, being a Samaritan, because uh, uh, you, you have three classifications of people here in the scriptures. You have the Jews, you have the Gentiles, which is anyone who's non-Jew, and then when a, a non-Jew or a Gentile uh, intermarries with a Jew, their offspring, uh, they're not full Jews, they're, they're called Samaritans. And so uh, I guess Timothy, that's never dawned on me before, but Timothy is, uh, is a Samaritan. I'm surprised it doesn't uh, classify him that way here. Uh, verse two, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Let me read those first two verses in the Amplified. Now Paul traveled to Derby and also to Lystra. A disciple named Timothy was there, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer in Christ. However, his father was a Greek. Timothy was well spoken of by the brothers and sisters who were in Lystra and Iconium. All right. That's very clear. Let's go to verse 3 in the KJV. Him, that's referring to Timothy, him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Now, isn't this interesting? Uh, in the last chapter, um, Paul and Barnabas were arguing uh, against the, the teachers that came up to Antioch and, and said that uh, unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. So Paul and Barnabas argued against that. And, and they ended up having to go to Jerusalem to talk to James and the apostles and uh, to to uh, debate this out and we if you can see the last video to to see how this uh, debate this argument uh, proceeded but uh, Paul was arguing you don't have to get circumcised and yet why is Paul consenting or just because there are um, Jews it says because of the Jews which were in those quarters so in that area, there's a lot of Jews. I'm assuming they're Jewish believers. And they, uh, uh, because of that, Paul ends up 
telling, uh, having Timothy get circumcised. Now at this time, of course, Timothy is not a, a little infant, eight days old is the, is the custom for the, the Jews to be circumcised at eight days old. So Timothy is uh, a grown man, I'm assuming, and at least uh, he's, uh, I'm sure he was uh, at least a teenager or uh, a young man. So getting circumcised at that point in your life must be a, an ordeal. Um, but Paul tells it, has him get circumcised. Timothy consents to it. And all this is to appease the Jews, which were in those quarters. Uh, so let me read verse 3 in the Amplified. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him as a missionary, uh, and he and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in the who were in those places, uh, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. So I find it very interesting that Paul would go all the way to Jerusalem, arguing that circumcision is not required, and. and he ends up conceding uh, because the Jewish believers were in the neighborhood there. And he, um, why would he do that? Why would he make that kind of a compromise? Uh, verse 4 in the KJV. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So these are the decrees, I, I guess, that uh, were made at the what's called the Council of uh, at Jerusalem that we covered in the last chapter, where they they had this argument. Uh, James and the the other the other apostles there they were uh, had the position that no, you had to be circumcised and and also practice. Uh, the, the, all the laws of Moses, and uh, Peter argued against it, and recounted his uh, his uh, mission that God gave him to go to Cornelius and his family, and and uh, they were Gentiles, the first Gentile believers. This, by the way, uh, the first Gentile believers is that's ten years in the past now. So ten years later. Uh, the, this argument has come up, well, these Gentile believers, don't they have to be circumcised? Paul argued against it, and then he gives in and has Timothy circumcised, I think, to appease the Jews in the area. Uh, but the decree that came down, or as I think it's, it's uh, phrased this way, uh, the sentence that was declared by James, the, the verdict, the decree, um, as a matter of fact, that's how it's phrased in verse 4 here. Says, and, and as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And they ended up making a compromise. And the question we should be asking ourselves is, why did they impose anything on these Gentile believers? Uh, why didn't they just say, okay, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to follow any of the laws of Moses. There's there's uh, no legal requirements on you. Just believe on Jesus. Um, that's what Paul said. That's what Peter said. Uh, and yet James couldn't just let it go with that. And, 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 and uh, he wasn't satisfied unless there was something, some legal things imposed upon them. So they had four requirements uh, don't eat meat that was sacrificed to idols don't eat anything that was strangled or i don't remember all four of them but they they insisted on these four things they said do these things and you'll do well don't be a fornicator and so on um, so it says in verse four and they went through the cities they delivered them the decree so they're repeating the decree that james came up with um, in Jerusalem. Verse, let me read the first four in the Amplified. Um, As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decrees decided on by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for the church to observe. 
verse 5 in the KJV. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. So uh, more people are becoming believers daily. It's, uh, we saw at uh, Pentecost, Peter preached, and I think 3,000 people believed that day. And the next time he preached, I think 5,000 believed. And it says more were added to the faith daily. Uh, every time Peter preached, uh, he had fantastic results. Maybe the greatest results in history. Uh, at least this, the greatest results, results recorded in the scriptures. Uh, maybe there have been other times uh, throughout history where someone's given a, uh, the gospel message and more than 5,000 believed. And I don't know. I, I know that... Uh, some of the modern day evangelists have these giant uh, meetings and thousands of people come forward. Um, but uh, so more people are established in the faith and the number is increasing daily. Verse six. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia, that's spelled P-H-R-Y-G-I-A, uh, and the region of Galatia. Now, Galatia, okay, this this is a very interesting uh, location in, in the church in Galatia. Some profound things were established in the book of Galatians. Uh, and, and, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Well, let's read that again carefully. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Uh, verse 7, after they were come to Mysia, M-Y-S-I-A, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bith Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not permitting them to preach in certain places. For some reason, it doesn't say why. Let's read this in the Amplified. Now they passed through, this is verse 6. Now they passed through the territory of Phrygia and Galatia after being forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in the west coast province of Asia Minor. So for some reason, the Holy Spirit told Paul and Barnabas this particular area you're not allowed to preach the gospel there. Why? We can we can only guess. I don't even have a guess. Uh, and after they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So we have two areas now where the Holy Spirit is not allowing Paul and Barnabas to go in, on their mission. Do you think... The Lord doesn't want them to hear the gospel? Or I would I would think that no, the Lord is just trying to, he's got another path, another route for their missionary journey in mind. For whatever the reason, the Lord wants them to go this way rather than that way. Um, so passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. Verse 9 in the KJV. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed to him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. So, Paul has a vision. This uh, strikes me as the vision that, uh, that um, Peter had uh, that led him to go to uh, preach to Cornelius. It's not exactly the same Thing, but there's a Paul Peter had a vision and it led him to uh, preach the gospel to the Gentiles to Cornelius and his family and friends. Now Paul has a a, a vision and in, he's uh, requested, "Will you come to Macedonia and help us?" Let me read that in the Amplified, verse nine. Then a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man from the Roman province of Macedonia was standing and pleading with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. What kind of help? 
it doesn't say it's preached to us. Uh, I, my first thought is that in help us is I, he's Paul's a missionary that uh, an evangelist uh, and that's his primary mission. Yes, yeah, he raises money and brings it back to the church in Jerusalem and offers them this kind of financial aid. But primarily, Paul's mission is evangelism. So when it says, help us, I'm inclined to think that it's requesting, uh, come and preach to us. Verse uh, 10 in the KJV. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Now, this is very important here. Who wrote the book of Acts? Uh, we covered this in the introduction, in the very first video in the series, uh, that it is Luke who uh, also wrote uh, the Gospel of Luke. And he, he wrote the book of Acts. And so see the first video to learn about Luke. And uh, so you get that context. But Luke is not only uh, recording things that were told to him, as he says in the first chapter of Acts, but he's also recording things as an eyewitness and a participant. So here, uh, maybe it said this before, but I don't remember it, if it did. I think this may be the first time the Luke writes, it immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. So read, uh, Luke, I think, is, is writing this, if my English is correct, in third person. We. Um, or maybe it's first person plural, I don't know, but it's, it's it, it, rather than saying Paul, Paul went, uh, and Paul endeavored to go to Macedonia. Paul, they, they endeavored to go to Macedonia. Luke writes, we. So he's, uh, he's running this from his perspective right now. Uh, uh, immediately, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Okay, so... Verse 10 confirms my first thoughts about uh, verse 9, when the man in the vision says to Paul, come over into Macedonia and help us. Paul understands it, that the Lord wants, wants them to, him to preach the gospel to them. I'm going to read 10 in the Amplified. Uh, and, and when he had seen the vision, we, oh, here, see, in the, see, the Amplified translation, uh, it's it's it is a translation, but it's it's also um, got extra words and thoughts in it. Um, that, as a matter of fact, that's why it's called amplified. Amplification means that you're expanding something, and so uh, it's not only telling you what the scripture says, but according to the amplified translators, they're inserting words to help. From, from their perspective to help you understand it more they're amplifying it they're kind of like it's kind of like uh, taking a translation and a commentary and mixing them together that's why I like the amplified but I read the KJV first because I trust it perfectly whereas the, the amplified and other modern translations uh, I, I find oftentimes that uh, there though there's either verses omitted or there's uh, translations that are um, I'm sure are, are bad. So even though the Amplified can be helpful, we must also, at least in my viewpoint, I, I use the, the KJV as my litmus test. Uh, so in verse 10 it says, and when he had seen the vision, we, including Luke, it says here. So they've inserted the thought that I emphasized in verse 10 when it says we, it is significant. It doesn't say they, it says we. And so in the Amplified Translation, they make that note that I um, I concluded also. It says, and when he had seen the vision, we, including Luke, tried to go into Macedonia once. Now, and when it says tried to go in, I guess that um, uh, that is translating the word endeavored. 
See, in the Amplified, it says immediately, we endeavored to go into Macedonia. So to endeavor is to try to do something. I don't know why I would, uh, if it says endeavor or we tried to, where there are some obstacles that didn't permit them to go immediately. Um, so in the Amplified, verse 10, and when he had seen the vision, we, including Luke, tried to go into Macedonia at once, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So that was Paul's conclusion, that the purpose of the vision wasn't to go there and help them in some other way, like bring them financial aid, but to, to preach the gospel. Verse 11 in the KJV. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi. Okay, well, Philippi is familiar. That's where we get the Philipp Philippian church. That Paul wrote the letter uh, to the Philippian church called uh, uh, Philippians. And, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. So that's an interesting fact that uh, Luke is including. Luke, being a historian, is, is very, very thorough in giving us some very pertinent uh, details about the times, uh, the geography, the, uh, the prominent uh, uh, leaders, uh, governors, and so on. All of that is included because Luke is a very thorough historian as he, as he writes this account. So, verse 12 in the KJV, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. Hmm. Um, now, in the Amplified, it says, we stayed on in this city for several days. Now, verse 13 in the KJV. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where a prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. So it's the Sabbath. We don't get any indication. This is 20 years after Pentecost. There is no indication at this point that... Um, we have a change to, from the Sabbath, which is um, uh, Saturday uh, in, in Judaism. The word Sabbath means the, uh, the, the last day, the seventh day, the last day of the week. <clears throat> and so that's the Sabbath day. That's when in uh, Judaism where people were told to rest on that day. And, and that's when they would just dedicate their, their thoughts and time to to God. That's when they would go to the, the synagogues. and uh, It's like going to church, but they would go to the synagogue on sat the Sabbath, which is Saturday. But uh, so even now, 20 years after Pentecost, 20 years after the beginning of the church, you still have this reference to the Sabbath. Um, so it says, on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside <clears throat> where prayer was wont to be made. Let me read this 13 in the Amplified. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate to the bank of the Gangetes River. Hmm. See, in, in the KJV, it doesn't specify a name for the city, for the river at all. It says, and we went out of the city by a riverside. And so somehow... The uh, Amplified puts in the Gangetes River. It identifies the name of the river. Uh, where we thought there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had come there. So they thought, they assumed that on the Sabbath at the river, there would be prayer going on for some reason. Was it common? Um, that... They did go to the river and pray. I love that gospel song. So let's go down to the river and pray. I have a playlist, by the way, uh, 
songs for your soul. <clears throat> um, probably, <clears throat> if there's a hundred songs, the first 90 of them are all uh, gospel type songs. Some of them modern, um, most of them the old gospel songs. Uh, and because the, 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 the lyrics, the words of those old gospel songs like uh, How Great Thou Art, uh, Old Rugged Cross, um, 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 Amazing Grace, and many others. Uh, the words of those songs uh, are, are really some of the best, most clear, simple teachings on the gospel, the message that salvation is offered as a free gift. If you study the lyrics, and I have a playlist where I, I go through three, I think three or four of those old hymns, and, and uh, we study the lyrics, and it's some of the best um, things I've ever seen written on salvation. Uh, so uh, that, I, the reason I got off on that tangent is because it says uh, they were expecting that if they went down to the river on the Sabbath, they find people in prayer. Uh, let's go to verse 14 in the KJV. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us. So Lydia worshiped God. And she was listening to the... Uh, to the discussion. It doesn't say that they were preaching. Well, it, it says in verse 13, we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted there. So was this a conversation about just, you know, it could be any number of things. Or, or was this, uh, they sat down and spoke to them about the gospel. I would assume that they were single-minded. Every opportunity they had to meet someone they wanted to tell them the gospel. <clears throat> so Lydia is there, a seller of purple from Thyatira, and she worshiped, she worshiped God. She was listening, uh, whose her heart, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Let's read verse 14 in the Amplified. <clears throat> a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a dealer in purple fabrics who was already a worshiper of God, uh, listened to us. So she was worshiping God, but was she a believer? Did she have faith in Jesus? Um, and maybe we'll learn more um, as we go on. But at this point, I'm, it's not so clear. She's a worshiper of God. She listened to us, and the Lord opened her heart to pay attention and to respond to the things said by Paul. Verse 15 in the KJV. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it says that she worshiped God. She listened to the message. God opened up her heart. She she li listened to Paul's message, which is the gospel. And uh, uh, she believed, and there, then she was baptized. And she asked, uh, hey, will you will you come to my household? Uh if if you if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, so she invites them to come into her house, and she constrained us. Let me see verse fifteen in the Amplified. If you have let me start at the beginning, verse fifteen. And when she was baptized, I'm going to read it from the. No, and when she was baptized along with her household. Now, why was her household baptized? They didn't just don't go along just baptizing people against their will or just say, hey, let's, uh, let's bathe you. I'm sure there was a gospel presentation. They believed as she did, and, and uh, they, they got baptized as she did. Because after 
after you believed in the, in the, the SOP, the standard operating procedure, was, okay, let's baptize you now. Uh, let's, let's make a public display of your faith. Let's immerse you in the water and bring you out so people can see that you have faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's a picture of that and you dying and being born again as a child of God. So uh, when they believed, they got baptized afterwards. <clears throat> and so it says in the Amplified, if you have judged me, and decided that I am faithful to the Lord, a true believer, come to my house and stay. And she persuaded us. So when it says us, again, <clears throat> uh, Luke is the writer. So he's when he says us, he's including himself. Luke was all part of this. Verse 16 in the, uh, in the KJV. <clears throat> and it came to pass... As we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So this, uh, this, uh, damsel possessed with the spirit of divination. In other words, she had the gift of divination. I don't think she was possessed with the spirit as, as we, we see, we see Jesus, um, casting out demons that were people who were possessed by demons. I don't, I don't think that it's a spirit, a particular spirit that's occupying her. It's just that the fact that she had the gift of divination, she had some kind of maybe Prophet, prophetic ability uh, but it but it brought her masters much gain so her master like apparently she's a slave and uh, she uh, her masters made money by her ability to like a fortune teller um, but then she says about Paul and the rest. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So she knew God had revealed to her that she understood who Paul and, and uh, the group was, and that they were servants of the true God, the Most High God, and that uh, they said, they show us the way of salvation. So she knew, she believed that their message was the true message of salvation, the way of salvation, the way to obtain or receive salvation. Let's look at verse 17 in there. Now let me, let me read 16 and 17 in the Amplified. It happened that as we were on our way to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, that is, a demonic spirit, claiming to foretell the future and discover hidden knowledge. So the Amplified is interpreting this as that it wasn't a gift from God that she had uh, to uh, as, a, as a prophetess, but it was um, a demonic spirit. Well, how is, it, how is a demonic spirit able to tell the, be a fortune teller uh, truly, uh, they can deceive, but uh, it says that in uh, back in 16 in the Amplified in the KJV, it says, A certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us. So, well, I guess maybe they're right, uh, but uh, I'm not so sure. It might have been a gift that God gave her, and God also revealed to her. The, the truth that Paul and, and his companions were true messengers of God and their message was, was the truth and she believed. Uh, so in, back to the Amplified. It happened that as we were on our way to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who, 
who had a spirit of divination, that is, a demonic spirit claiming, claiming. So they were saying that he didn't necessarily have the ability to foretell the future, but this demonic spirit would claim that it could. A demonic spirit claiming to foretell the future and discover hidden knowledge. And she brought her owners a good profit by fortune telling. Verse 17, she followed after Paul and us and kept screaming and shouting, these men are servants of the most high God. They are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. So how did she know that? I, God did reveal this to her. They are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Verse 18 in the, in the uh, KJV. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, Hmm, okay. So this is making it clear that uh, Paul is recognizing that this that her her ability as a fortune teller was a spirit that she was, I guess, possessed with, a, a, a spirit of divination. And he, Paul said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. I'm a little bit surprised that when she had the spirit of divination and then she's proclaiming, that um, these are these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. She understood that, and she proclaimed it. I, I get the impression that she believed it, but maybe it was just the spirit in her that was saying it. Why would the spirit, if it was a malevolent spirit occupying her, why would the spirit want to? her to uh, say those words to everybody, to continue following around saying, these are the servants of God. Listen, uh, they'll tell you how to get saved. She's saying that over and over again. Um, I don't know why Paul would want her to stop, stop saying that, actually. I don't understand that. Seemed like Paul would have, unless he's just upset because he, he say, believes that the source of her message was a demonic spirit. So in that case, you can see how he could object, but what she's saying, she shouldn't have any, he shouldn't have any objection to. She's proclaiming to everybody, listen to them, they're men of God. They'll tell you how to get saved. Why would Paul object to that? Um, so uh, verse, verse 18, in the uh, KJV, and this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And, in verse 19, and, and when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, so Paul cast out the, the demon, even though the demon was actually helping, uh, he cast him out. But the masters now, they were losing money because their slave girl was, was uh, producing an income for them as a fortune teller. So they, they were uh, suffering a, a loss of income because Paul cast the demon out. So... You can see why they'd be upset with what Paul had done. Verse 19. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace and unto the rulers. So they get Paul and Silas. There must have been a... I'm assuming that they were outnumbered. Uh, not, that, not that Paul and Silas would resist them, but they were, it said that they were caught. They caught Paul and Silas. When they caught them, maybe they grabbed a hold of them and it drew them into the marketplace of the rulers. Let me see verse 19 in the Amplified. But when her owners saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul 
and Silas and dragged them before the authorities in the marketplace where trials were held. And when they had brought them before the chief magistrates, they said, let's go back to the KJV. And these men, this is verse 20, these men being Jews, see, they don't consider them Christians. They're not familiar with Christianity, apparently. They're familiar with Judaism. They thought they were Jews. And in the beginning, uh, Christianity was just con considered to be a, a sect of Judaism. And this is part of this, the whole book of Acts. This teaches us that how the, the, um, the church went through this transformation, this transition from being a, a sect of Judaism, uh, first just for the Jews, and then for, now the Gentiles are involved. Uh, and, but then gradually, uh, reaching the point where it, it no it, the, the Jews are phased out and it becomes pretty much exclusively a religion or a, of, of Gentiles rather than Jews. Uh, but right now, they're considered in the, these men as Jews. So verse 20, and brought them to the magistrate saying, these men being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. <clears throat> and the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Rent off their clothes. It reminds me of the tearing of the clothes that we have with uh, Caiaphas at the trial of Jesus. It's a, it's a sign of outrage and blasphemy. They would tear their clothes because it's blasphemy. Well, apparently, these people, they're Gentiles, they're Romans, and they, they have a similar custom where they would rent. Oh, maybe it says rent off their clothes. Maybe it's referring to the rent taking off the clothes of Paul and, and Silas. Let's see. For, let me read that in the Amplified. Uh, starting with verse 20. Uh, and when they had brought them before the chief magistrates, they said, these men who are Jews are throwing our city into confusion and causing trouble. They are publicly teaching customs which are unlawful for us as Romans uh, to accept or observe. So why would it be unlawful for a Roman to accept or observe uh, what they thought was Judaism. Uh, verse 22 in the KJV, no, verse 22 in the Amplified, the, the crowd also joined in the attack against them. So first you have the, uh, the, the people who were suffering this loss of income, you know, owners of the slave, and they uh, they drag them before the magistrate. They uh, they present their argument against Paul and Silas, and then uh, then the people, the public, the crowd. It says also joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them. Okay, it says and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them. So this is saying that they they tore off the robes of Paul and Silas. So it wasn't tearing their clothes as, as, as Caiaphas did as a sign of, of, of outrage over the blasphemy. They were tearing the clothes off of Paul and Silas and ordered that Paul and Silas be beaten with rods. Beaten with rods. What is a rod? It's, it's different than a, a whip where you get whipped with a cord. Uh, it's a, it's a rod is a, a stick. It's the size of the stick. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it was three or four feet long, and maybe an inch in diameter. I, that's what I'm, how I'm imagining it: a rod beaten with a rod. <clears throat> and you know, Paul was beaten with rods like this uh, three or four times. He was, he was beaten with whips 
three or four times. Th 40 lashes less one, thir which is 39 lashes, which, which is what Jesus was supposed to get, except they far exceeded the, the, in the, the beating of Jesus, I believe. Um, but these kinds of beatings, it's possible for a person to be beaten to death. So this is a very serious to be beaten with rods. In, in the verse 23 in the KJV, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison. So it's not enough just to beat them. The magistrate orders them to be beaten and then put into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So the inner prison, where is that? That's not the edge of the, if you went through the front door of the prison. No, and you're right there. No, it's, you go deep down into the belly, into the, uh, the, the, the gutter area of the, of the prison, the darkest, deepest area. Uh, I'm sure that it's, it's, they're sent there and it's written this way to make us understand that this is the most unpleasant area of the prison. <clears throat> Um, let me read verse 23 in the Amplified. After striking them many times with the rods, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. Now, here in the Amplified, it says they threw them into prison. It doesn't say anything about uh, Oh, in verse 24 is where it says inner prison. Let me read verse 24 in the Amplified. Uh, he, having received such a strict command, threw them into the inner prison, okay, which is the dungeon. So it's not just the prison, the, 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 uh, the, the, the better part of the prison. This is the dungeon. Um, threw them into the inner prison, the dungeon, and fastened their feet in the stalks in an agonizing position. That's the Amplified. Um, so, yeah, when you put in the stocks, uh, it, it's, it's intended to be not only secure you, but to be very uncomfortable. Uh, it's not just a way of restraining someone, but it's a form of punishment. So it's very uncomfortable. And it says here in the Amplified, and fasten their feet in the stocks, in an agonizing position. So, when I think of the stocks, though, I think of hands and head in the stocks. That's the way that the picture I've gotten uh, with, uh, like, the, the Salem witch trials and the, that era of American history where people put in stocks. Uh, they're, they're published... They're punished publicly in their heads and arms are put in the stocks. But in this case, it says their feet were fast in the stocks. Just their feet. Verse 25 in the uh, KJV. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Uh, I think that their prayers and maybe even their songs. Remember I said earlier that there are, are many of the older hymns. Um, Just as I am. Um, How great thou art. Old rugged cross. These hymns, the words is a gospel message that is some of the best I've heard. Maybe the hymns, the songs that they sang were were they ancient songs or were they contemporary Christian songs that there were either Paul and Silas were singing uh, the, in a way that the, presenting the gospel in their own words but singing it perhaps uh, or maybe these were just uh, popular Christian songs of that time that they were singing but I imagine that the songs and the prayers were uh, a gospel message. You know, if I was praying publicly and uh, or singing 
in that case, I would say the words about thank you, Jesus. So thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for promising me life everlasting. Thank you for promising me eternal life in heaven. I thank you. I trust you. I'm relying on you. This is the kinds of prayer and, and, and song I would sing in that case. And imagine that these were not just ordinary songs. These were songs that taught and inspired. And, and so it says, and the prisoners heard them. Let's, let's read these verses in the Amplified. Verse 25. But about midnight, when Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. When he prays God, what are you praising him for? Well, thank you, God, for creating me. Thank you, God, for all my blessings. Most of all, thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for giving me eternal life in heaven. Thank you for your promises. I know I can rely on you. You cannot lie. You cannot break a promise. I'm confident I'm going to go to heaven. This kind of a, a prayer. Uh, and it says, but about midnight when Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Verse 26 in the KJV. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Now, would it be normal if you're locked up in stocks or tied up with bands or that an earthquake would cause the stocks and the bands to, to be loosened and they'd be free? Earthquakes don't cause that. So this was certainly an act of God shaking the earth and untying them and freeing them from the stocks. It wouldn't, that wouldn't just naturally happen because of an earthquake. It has to be God loosening them, setting them free. Verse 26 in the Amplifies says, suddenly there was a great earthquake, so powerful that the very foundations of the prison were shaken, and at once all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. Verse 27 in the KJV, and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had fl had been fled. So he's a Roman guard. Uh, his responsibility is to, to make sure no one escapes. If someone does escape, then he knows that uh, the, the sentence for a Roman guard letting people escape is a death sentence. So he's ready just to take his own life, knowing that it would probably be easier for him to take his own life than the horrible way maybe that he'd, he'd be punished and die. So he was going to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Let me read that in the Amplified. When the jailer, shaken out of sleep, saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, thinking that the prisoners had escaped. Verse 28 in the KJV. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Well, Paul, many people probably would, they were, uh, if they were not on this mission as a, as a, as a Christian, if Paul was with, it, with this purpose, uh, it, our instincts would be, don't say anything. Let him kill himself so that we can all uh, escape. Uh, but Paul's priority was not escaping from prison, being set free. Paul's priority was spreading the gospel. And he didn't want the man to kill himself. Um, so he told, said, no, don't kill yourself. We're still here. There's no need. The, the need for him to kill himself was based upon the capital punishment for him letting prisoners escape. Verse 29, Then he called for a light, this is the guard, 
and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, why would he ask such a question? I mean, first of all, he, he realizes he doesn't have to kill himself. But his first thought now is to ask them, what must I do to be saved? Tell me how to get saved. And what, why in the world would he come up with a question like that? Uh, I think the only, the only logic uh, we can, we can uh, apply to this is that he had listened to their prayers and their singing, their conversation. He overheard it. And uh, they were talking about salvation. They were preaching salvation. Their prayers and, and hymns were about salvation. And so he, he said he was, he heard about it, but now he wanted to be sure. What do I have to do? I want to be saved. He was, he was inspired by their, what they had done. They could have just let him kill himself and be free. But instead, they cared enough for him. They wanted him, no, don't, you don't have to kill yourself. We're still here. We're not trying to escape. That was an inspirational thing. He, he, he saw that they cared more about him than they did their own freedom. So he was inspired and he, it gave him, um, confidence that these men are special. They're, I want to know more about what they've been praying about and singing about. Tell me, you're talking about salvation. What must I do to be saved? You're saved. I wonder what I have to do. Now, one of the key words here is must. So he's, he's saying, what, are, what is the requirement? What am I required to do? So uh, it's going to be very interesting when Paul, I'm assuming Paul gives the answer. It doesn't say Paul specifically, but I think most people assume Paul is the one. Paul is the spokesman. And he gives them the answer to the question. And, uh, now, does Paul say to the man, what must I do to be saved? Well, the answer is you've got to uh, repent of all your sins and change your life. You've got to make a dramatic change. You've got to stop all the sin out of your life. Completely turn over a new leaf, change yourself, make yourself presentable to God. You're just a horrible sinner and, and there's no way you can go to heaven unless you change your life. And then you've got to uh, get water baptized and you've got to follow a strict set of religious rules that we're going to impose on you. Uh, see, this is the answer that many churches today would give the man. So, but what does Paul say? What's the answer to the question? What must I do to be saved? Verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Well, he just simply says, believe on the Lord Jesus. Uh, now, if, if more was required, more than believing on Jesus, and Paul didn't tell him, Paul would be negligent. And if, if Paul, uh, if what if Paul knew that more was required, but purposely held it back from him, it would be evil. To tell him all you got to do is believe in Jesus when Paul all along knew you had to repent of your sins and change your life and get baptized and uh, you know, a laundry list of other things. If Paul knew that these other things were required and didn't tell the man, he was either negligent or evil for not telling the man everything that he needed to do. Is that the case? No. <clears throat> Paul told him what he must do. And, and there was only one thing he must do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. It's that easy. Believe on Jesus. Now, here's the big mistake that people make is that they, they cannot accept the salvation is so simple and so easy. God is so gracious. He'll give you salvation if you just believe on Jesus. They don't know that. 
that's too easy. So they they want to uh, redefine what it means to believe on Jesus. I have a, a video titled, Believe Defined. Why would I have to define what the word believe means? It seems should be obvious if we weren't talking about theology uh, and we're just in a secular conversation with something, you ask them, what does it mean to believe? Most people would say to well, you, you think something to be true. What does it mean, what does it mean to believe on something? Well, you, you think it's true and, and you're, you're, you're trusting on it, you're depending on it. And this is how we would define it if naturally, if we weren't theologians. But the theologians, they cannot accept that salvation is simple and easy and God is gracious. We're saved by grace. Not because we've earned it and deserve it in any way. We don't. We don't deserve it. We, we're saved because God's gracious. They say, people say grace is unmerited favor. It, it's not because of any personal merit, but simply because God is gracious. He's anxious. He's eager to give us salvation. And what do you have to do now to receive it? He's, he's eager to give it to you. All you got to do is receive it through faith. So I would say believe on Jesus means that you're, you're depending on Jesus. You're relying on Jesus. Instead of thinking that there's some other means of salvation, there are other requirements. Instead, you're relying completely on Jesus. Believe, when you believe on Jesus, it means you're believing on him and, and no one else. When you believe on Jesus, it means you're believing on him and nothing else. Not water baptism, not changing your life, not following religious rules, not enduring to the end, not persevering. But you, you're, but believing on Jesus means you're believing on this person, Jesus, as the means of salvation. He alone has the ability to give you salvation and he is faithful to give it to you because he promised you. It, if you'll trust him. And the Bible says God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. So you can depend on it. Believing on Jesus is depending on him. Believing that his promise is true. He's able and he's faithful to give you salvation, just as he said he would. So, um, now, believing, this it reminds me of the, another question that was asked probably 20 years earlier or more where some of the, the Jewish people asked Jesus what are the works uh, what works does God require of us what are the uh, the, the works that um, how is it phrased um, what are the works works of God, or what works, I can't remember the verse now exactly how it's phrased, but it's, they're asking Jesus what works are required of them to be saved. And Jesus said, this is the work of God. Believe on the one he has sent. God sent his son, Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh to be the savior. You believe on him. Jesus said the same thing that, that Paul is saying here. Jesus said, the work of God is this, believe on the one God sent, Jesus Christ. Paul is asked, what must we do? Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus. The same answer that, that uh, Jesus gave 30 years, 20 years earlier. And, it, and it's interesting when it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Does that mean that if someone believes on Jesus and gets saved, that everybody in their living under their roof gets saved at the same time. Some people actually think that when someone gets saved, their children are automatically saved because of this verse here and their house. No, it just means that you're, the same thing applies to your house. Uh, I'm telling you, if you believe on Jesus, you'll be saved. And uh, this same thing is true for your children and your wife. If they believe on Jesus, they'll be saved.
So, verse 32. Let me read these verses in the Amplified, see how it says it. I'm a little afraid to do it. Um, verse 30. And after he brought them out of the inner prison, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they answered, believe in the Lord Jesus. It says believe in rather than believe on. Is there a, a difference in believing in and believing on? Believe in the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior and entrust yourself to him. I like that. I like how the Amplified states that. As your personal Savior. That means you're believing Jesus is going to save you. And entrust yourself to him. That means I'm relying on him. I'm putting, I'm trusting that Jesus is going to save me. He is my savior and I trust that he will do it. That's beautifully stated there in the Amplified. And, and, and it says, and you will be saved if you just believe in Jesus and tr trust Jesus. You will, and, and you and your household, if they also believe, it says here. So in the Amplified, agrees with what I said, is that when it says you and your household, it's saying, well, that the same doctrine applies to your household. The same message applies to them. The same rule. The rule is, if you believe in Jesus, you get saved. That's what's required. That's the one requirement. Faith in Jesus. Now, verse 32 in the KJV, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house, so they went to his house, presented the gospel, taught them all about Jesus. And, and verse 33, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. So the, the, the guard took them, well, that would be Paul and Silas, and washed their stripes, their wounds from their beating, um, and was baptized. That's referring to the jailer. The bab, uh, he and all his Straightway, he and all his family. So the jailer and his family, they all believed, then they all got baptized right away. Verse 34, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants saying, Let those men go. Well, that's good news. They decided they're going to let him go. They've been beaten. They've been spent the night in jail. Now just let him go. Verse 36. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. So I, I, I'm assuming that they've e either gone back to the jail after that night of presenting the gospel the jailer and his family got saved. They all got baptized. Did they go back into the jail? And that's why that they were back in the jail and let out? Or were they not in the jail, but they were told to set them free, and, and then they, they weren't aware that, hey, they've already been set free. Uh, let me read that and amplify. Verse 35. Now, when day came, the chief magistrates sent their officers saying, release those men. And the jailer repeated the words to Paul saying, uh, the chief magistrates have sent word to release you. So come out now and go in peace. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming that they had gone back into jail. Voluntarily, they went back into jail because again, they did not want to escape because if they escaped, the prison guard would be executed. So they went back into jail, and then they were released. Uh, now, verse 37 of the KJV. <clears throat> but Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. So, Paul's, under the circumstances, they've been tried, they've been convicted, they've been uh, beaten, they've been put into prison, and now they're released. But Paul, instead of just going 
and being released, Paul decides to take a stand here and say, wait, we're Romans. You, you can't just do what you've done to us. We're Romans. There's a significance of being a Roman citizen. You know, they think that, well, they're, they're Jews. They remember in the beginning it said that they, were, they thought they were Jews. But uh, the secret here is at least Paul is a Roman citizen. This becomes very important and helpful to him in the remainder of his life, being a Roman citizen. Uh, verse 38 in the KJV. Um, let me read 37 in the Amplified though, first. Uh, but Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without a trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they are sending us out secretly? No, let them come here themselves and bring us out. It's kind of obstinate of Paul, isn't it? Verse 38 in the KJV, And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. See, Romans have more rights than the non-Romans. And uh, the way they were treated, and considering they're actually Roman citizens, the, their, their, the backlash against them could be serious. Verse 39, And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. <clears throat> and they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. The house of Lydia, if I remember correctly, Uh, verse 14, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. <clears throat> so Lydia is not the same as the uh, uh, fortune teller, right? if I remember correctly here. Now, so Lydia in verse 14 and the fortune teller in verse 16, these are different people. So um, the chapter concludes, verse 40, and they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. <clears throat> Let's read that one in the Amplified. So they left the prison and went to Lydia's house. And when they had seen the brothers and sisters, they encouraged and comforted them and left. Let me read the footnote here uh, uh, on this uh, citizenship. Uh, it says, Paul was a Roman citizen because he was born in Tarsus, capital of Cilicia, and a city that the emperor Augustus <clears throat> had pronounced free because of its support of Rome. Nothing is known of Silas's family background, but if his name is short for Silvanus, it is a Roman name taken from the god of the forest, and it could be that Silas was also born a Roman citizen. Uh, details on Roman citizenship at that time are sketchy at best, but it is clear from Acts that punishing a citizen without a trial and guilty verdict was illegal, probably involving severe penalties for the magistrates in charge, also a Roman citizen charged with a crime, had the right to go to Rome and be tried in the emperor's court. <clears throat> and this is eventually what happens to Paul uh, later on in the final chapters. Okay, that concludes the chapter 16. So, I think the most important thing, of course, is Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31, the, the question, what must I do to be saved? And the answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is one of the most important verses in the Bible because we, we understand the simplicity of salvation uh, and that... Uh, not only do, are we saved simply by believing, but Paul later on goes on to argue in, in uh, just as he did at the beginning, of, in, in 
Acts chapter 15, he argues, what? You're telling people they can't be saved unless they're circumcised? No, don't do that. Don't teach that. So from that point on, Paul is not only saying, believe on the Lord Jesus, but don't require anything else like circumcision or Moses' laws or temple worship or animal sacrifices. Don't require anything else. Simply believe on Jesus. If you, as he says in Galatians and Romans, if you add anything else, you have nullified the grace of God. You've made it of none effect. So it's, it, 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 there is no effect in the, in the message of salvation that says, believe on Jesus and also do these things. There's, it's ineffective. You can't get saved that way. This is the argument that Paul continues uh, uh, arguing for that, God, that message. So as Jesus said, you're saved by believing. Peter and John say you're saved by believing. Paul says you're saved by believing. But Paul, throughout the rest of his ministry, he has an extra burden. And because the Judaizers following him from place to place continue and, and try to tamper with his work and, and introduce Judaism wherever he goes. And so he has this additional burden, and that is, I, I'm telling you, all you got to do is believe on Jesus and don't you dare add anything else to it or it's spoiled and it has no effect at all. That is to me the great contribution of the Apostle Paul. Uh, all right, so uh, that'll conclude the study of chapter 16. Next time we'll pick up with chapter 17. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.